Hello, welcome. Um, I'm Andrew Warner, one of the producers here at the Long Now Foundation. Um, first, a bit of housekeeping, if everyone can remember to turn off their phones. Um, when we were coming out of the pandemic, we had a moment where we weren't selling out shows like tonight. And um, we sort of put our heads together at Long Now to try and figure out why people leave the house these days. And um, one of the reasons we decided was for people to hang out with other people. So um, that was one of the inspirations for uh, finding this venue and choosing it. So we hope tonight you get a chance to see some old friends, make some new friends. Um, we're going to have the venue after the talk. So feel free to order drinks and stick around and um, say hi to your neighbor. So. When people become a Long Now member, there's um, a little like sign up reason box. I don't know if you guys remember this, but um, we ask why you're joining Long Now. People tell these incredible stories and we've known for years because we get an email every time someone joins and becomes a Long Now member and we read each of these reasons. And it turns out Long Now members are this is sort of incredible group of people. So you have artists and architects and parents and students and designers and just everything in between. And um, for years, we've wanted to figure out a way to showcase this incredible talent. And uh, it wasn't until the Long Now Member Summit in 2016 that we finally got a chance to um, sort of have Long Now members take the stage. Um, and that was the first Long Now Member Ignite. Um, we loved it, and we've kept up the tradition ever since. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our host for the evening, Ignite Talk founder, Brady Forrest. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you to The Long Now and to Club Fugazi for having us back here. And yeah, I'm not just here to model your grandmother's uh, 70s couch. Um, I'm here to introduce uh, these 13 amazing speakers that we have from around the world. And they are each going to be giving an Ignite Talk. And an Ignite Talk is a very, very specific, torturous format if you are a speaker, and super fun if you get to listen to it. So we lean in heavily on infotainment. So it is, you know, you can take a very serious topic, but we make it fun, we make it fast, and we pack it with stories. And so Ignite started in 2006, and we had 25 speakers, which is way too many. And each of those speakers gave a five-minute talk with 20 slides, 15 seconds a slide that auto advance. Exactly, that's what I mean by torturous. Uh, well over 10,000 people have done them around the world and you have the pleasure of being in the room as the next 13 graduate into an Ignite class. So let's just give them a big round of applause. They have done a lot of work on this. A couple of people have spent well over half their work week on their talks <laughs> over the weekend. Uh, now, our first speaker, though, is an Ignite veteran. She is like black belt level Ignite. This might be like her fourth or fifth, depending on how you count it. And she is an artist, an entrepreneur. She has main character energy. And I highly recommend that you check out her art on her Instagram, Connieverse. Please welcome out Connie Yang. Hello. Oh, this incredible woman, uh, Wang Od. She is a Filipino tattoo artist, and she is on the cover of Vogue, as you can see. And at 106 year old, it was this year's April issue of Vogue. She was the oldest person to grace the cover. She has been tattooing since she was 16, so she's been doing it for 90 years. That's crazy. People travel to Vanilla, uh, Manila and then go on a car ride for 12 hours in order to get tattooed by her. And she passes this tradition on to younger women in her generation. That's really amazing. So if someone who's 106 can do that and I'm like thinking, I'm tired, I don't know, I'm running out of time, what to do, how do I get things done? 
that was a great story. So I started researching other people who are in their 90s and 100 and seeing all the different things that they do. So here are some of their stories, starting with a local, Dorothy Lathan. She lives in San Francisco, has been in Ocean Beach for uh, since the 1960s. She uh, keeps Black history alive in the city and was part of creating the Museum of African Diaspora, the MOAD, and she was also one of the first Black school teachers. Jack Hearn, he is a judo sensei in Great Britain. At 99, he just recently got his, his 10th don, which is the highest belt that you can get for um for judo and that's quite, it makes him the oldest person who's ever done that and he moves every single day yayoi kusama she is the highest paid living female artist today she lives in a psychiatric um hospital by choice in tokyo and every, every day she walks across the street to our art studio so she can paint and actually create pieces and she does this consistently it's amazing iris apple she is an interior uh, decorator by trade has worked for nine u.s presidents but really catapulted to success when she was 84 and did a solo show at the met and she is now a model muse influencer she um is oh something jumped <laughs> she, um, she's done awesome david attenborough what a living treasure he's fantastic he has created over 100 documentaries created the uh, natural history documentary as you know it today with beautiful cinematog cinematography photography and he has also won a bafta and uh, we go on to dj sumirak she uh runs a dumpling shop by day and is a DJ by night. She DJs in Shinjuku regularly, has also DJed in Paris and New Zealand, has dreams of DJing in New York. And that's her in her dumpling shop that she's, she's been doing for some 60 some years since she was in high school. She started DJing when she was in her early 80s and it's continued and that is just fantastic. I want to go see her. I hope everyone else does too. Batty Winkle, she's one of my favorites. She um, lost her husband and her son and was kind of in a slump and then her granddaughter posted a photo of her on Instagram and she became super popular because she wears vibrant clothes, is kind of um, really really loud and out there and now is also like, a, like an influencer, like officially an influencer. I love that her bio says, it's really hard to see, it says, stealing your man since 1928. It's really, really great. I mean, what a hero. I hope we can all be a little bit like her and embrace that energy. Uh, Dr. Howard Tucker, he is the world's oldest currently practicing doctor. He's a neurologist. And he actually says retirement is bad for cognitive, um, cognitive ability. It actually decreases uh, your, your mind. It actually slows you down. And here, one of my favorites, uh, my grandmother. She moved into a retirement community seven years ago, and instead of just slowing down and doing nothing, she started teaching poetry to the other members of the community. And she wrote a book on poetry. Her uh, university did a documentary on her. It became super popular, actually. She's on TV interviews. She went viral in China. She came, became known as Poetry Grandma and got 150 million views. It's really, it's really spectacular. She kind of is just like, well, I'm just working hard and doing the thing. So it's, I'm very happy to be with, with her. So many great lessons. Um, overall, keep moving your body, keep using your brain, keep learning, keep being curious. It's never too late to start anything. So many examples, they started very, very late in life. Think of yourself as young and stay connected with your community. Ending with Julia Hurricane Hawkins, who started running when she was 100 years old and is the current record holder for the, her age group in the 100 meter sprint. And I love her quote, I feel like a shooting star and I don't know when it's going to end. Well, that's so great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Connie. And uh, Grandma Yang, if you're watching this, it is not too late for you to do your first Ignite Talk. <laughs> totally, totally. Uh, our next speaker is an SF local. He flew in just for this. He was away, and he's about to reveal a hobby he's been working on for about eight years for the very first time. Please welcome out Altai Kavent. In 2015, I watched a TED Talk by a long now board member, David Eagleman. Uh, it was about how to create new senses for humans. Uh, turns out we can only see a tiny little slice of the whole electromagnetic spectrum. The, whole, the rainbow that we can see is, is that little bit, bit right there. I'm going to take you into the ultraviolet today. All right, fluorescence. That's when you shine a, a flashlight of one color on an object, and it, and it glows a different color. Think of like a, you know, shining something on a $20 bill or like a psychedelic poster. 
Okay, in 1962, uh, natural flu fluorescence was found in a glowing jellyfish. In the, in the 90s, we sequenced it, we put it in another animal, and the people who did that got the Nobel Prize for it. This is my childhood best friend, Sam. Uh, he got his PhD in fluorescence. And one day he told me that he thought there was like a lot of other stuff out there in the ocean, but we kind of brought the jellyfish into the lab and forgot to go back outside and keep looking. So I started thinking. So inspired by David Eagleman and Sam, I got scuba certified and I bought a black light. It sat in a drawer for like six months, waiting for my next dive, but then I was like, I wonder if things on land glow. So I started exploring. I took my first night hike. Within 15 minutes or so, I saw this glowing moth and I was hooked. Since then, I've been like, spent many moons out there in the dark, exploring the world in ultraviolet light. And I'm finding all these crazy things that glow. So, problem is my photos were really blurry back then. Enter my friend Henry. He's an amazing photographer, travel blogger. Uh, he, he encouraged me to get better, to get a better camera, get better lighting, and taught me how to use it. So the, the photos started getting a little better around now. Uh, the pandemic hit in 2020. I couldn't go scuba diving, but I realized, oh, I could find some ocean creatures in tide pools. So I started exploring the California tide pools. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite discoveries. So these are Pacific mole crabs. This is right down the street from the Long Now offices. Um, basically, like when the, when the water comes in, they stick up these like feathery antenna, they grab food, and then the water retreats and they, they pull them back in again. It's really beautiful. All right, I wanted to explore another biome. My friend Tamsin, who's a biomimicry expert, she opened the Brago Institute for Living Design in the California desert. So I did a creative residency down there and I found this. All right, remember Sam? Well, we're back in Maine for the holidays. He had heard about this otter living at this pond in a cemetery, so we went and go to go see it with his family. I still don't know if otters glow, but I got an idea while I was out there. Graveyard? More like raveyard. <laughs> like and glow like crazy. Like crazy. Everyone gets like a unique portrait of, you know, painted by nature after they die. And it's painted over millions, or not millions, but hundreds of years. It's a girl with a snail earring. She was like 10 feet high. It was hard to, hard to capture. There's like sprinklers hitting me every 30 seconds. The snails are moving really fast. <laughs> All right, so what is lichen? Lichen is actually a partnership between algae and a fungus. So it's not a single organism. It's, it's a partnership. So here the red is the algae, and the yellow is the lichen starting to, starting to lichenize it, basically. The algae makes, makes uh, food from sunlight, and the lichen basically creates a greenhouse for it. Turns out this combination is what has created soil. They're the lichen are the pioneers, basically. They come, they come to like harsh landscapes, they break down the soil, and they can even survive in space. All right, back down to Earth. Here's, a, here's some backstage. <laughs> so I, I was in the cemetery. I called up Henry for advice. He's on a beach in Thailand with models. <laughs> you can see me like really regretting my life decisions here. So next stop, Thailand. <laughs> Just kidding, I went to the UK to find some more graveyards. <laughs> I wanted to find some older stuff because lichen grows very, very slowly, as I told you. <sighs> All right, I bet now you're wondering, like, you're starting to get curious. I hope you're maybe starting to let go of some certainty, starting to invite in some curiosity. Maybe you're wondering what around you glows, why things glow how they glow, or maybe you're imagining your own tombstone. David Eagleman thinks that there's like a bunch of Nobel Prizes hidden out there. I agree, I think there's a whole new branch of science. I think there's a whole new genre of photography, and I think we have to find it. I think we have to find it collectively because it's like too much for me. So I think we should start a citizen science project to go explore the outdoors at night. So come join us at glowhut.org. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you, Altai, for introducing us all to the word graveyard. Uh, now, our next speaker was kind enough to film his talk in Canada. You know, the Long Now has members all over the world. Not all of them are able to be here. So we have four videos tonight. So I ask you to be a little extra quiet because it's tough to hear. Uh, but our next speaker is a great storyteller. Please welcome 
Trevor Haldenby. Good evening, everybody. My name is Trevor Haldenby. I am from Toronto, Canada. I am Long Now member number 378. And this is Are You Now or Will You Ever Be a Fossil? When I said that word, fossil, uh, each of you probably had a different treasure pop into your mind. Maybe it was Archaeopteryx, Lucy the Australopithecus, or this marvelous petrified tree. But the truth is, fossils are hiding a little bit of a superpower. You see, they're actually naturally occurring time machines. Like a gadget, they offer us a magical experience at a revolutionary price, a free window into the deep past and into the distant future. Just holding one in your hand can encourage you to more deeply consider our legacies as individuals and as a species. So what is a fossil? Anyway, well, whether it's a brachiopod or a brachiosaurus, no real relation, fossils are the trace or bodily remains of plants and animals from the past that have been mineralized into rocks. This process can take millions of years, and as a young man, I was privileged enough to be able to explore the tail end of it in a landscape they don't often show Canadians in the U.S. travel brochures, the Badlands of Montana. In these badlands, as a scientific research assistant, I dug up 75 million-year-old dinosaur eggs, like the one you see here, turning them from science objects into art objects by wrapping them in plaster of Paris for the CT scanners. And that summer, I really understood what it meant to see nature through multiple ways of knowing, scientific and artistic. That summer in the badlands gave me a new lens on life's evolution and on myself. They hit me right in the wonder zone. And if you were to look at the world for a while through fossil frame glasses like these, what you might notice is that our relationship to this static geological process is quite a bit more dynamic than it first seems. You see, just as we're influencing the Earth's atmosphere and biological systems, we're also influencing its geological flows and systems of record with our civilization. The odds of winding up a pristine Mona Lisa fossil like this Albertan ankylosaur are increasingly unlikely. And that's if we have anything big like an ankylosaur left to fossilize. You see, in order to become a fossil, you have to first go through most of the original Drake equation, the emergence of life on a rocky planet near a star. But then there are additional bonus filters for things like body composition, the speed of your burial, the time you've been left snug and undisturbed, and burial in the right acidic sediment, which given acidification is getting harder to ensure. It used to be that taking a long walk off a short pier in cement shoes was the best way to get started with self-fossilization, but now we're not so sure. So as we become as gods, as Stuart Brand likes to say, influencing the natural cycles of fossilization, what would it be like to play Medusa. The truth is, fossils have been a part of many human cultures for a very long time. In the Cree Canadian painter Kent Monkman's works, fossils are often a crucial part of the stories and songs that people share of the land. And in the works of other modern artists and architects, we see unique vision and inspiration for how fossilization might show up in our future or what bodies our descendants might be leaving behind. It isn't that hard to imagine us leaving a Cambrian explosion of waste fossils in our wake, forks and filaments fused into fractal patterns in the rock, like the trilobites that we're familiar with in stone. But for the early adopters among us, there is hope. Scientists and engineers are right now cracking the code on synthetic fossilization, turning a million-year process into a long weekend set on broil in the lap. And it's not hard for me to imagine, here with the Long Now crowd, that a member of tonight's audience might be the first contemporary human to be fossilized for science or for art. We've covered a lot of ground here in five minutes, but next time you hold a fossil in your hands or look at one in a museum, Remember to feel the wonder 
They are nature's time machines, gateways into the art and science of belong now. Thank you. He is a guy who knows his audience. Look at, listen to those callbacks. Um, <laughs> our next speaker flew in just for this talk. This is her first time in San Francisco. She's an entrepreneur for the past two decades, combining science, art, and technology into various projects and companies. And this next project is no exception. Please welcome out Yael Schatz. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here. What if I told you that each and every one of us is harboring an endless treasure in our own home? Every day, we go about our lives, cooking meals, spending time with loved ones, and leaving behind traces of ourselves in the form of the dust in our home. Crumbs from the food we ate and smoke residue from our cooking fibers from our clothes, hair and nail fragments, skin cells, laundry and perfume odor molecules, pets dander, pollen, fungi, minerals, man-made pollution. The combination of these elements can be as unique as a fingerprint. Like pictures, dust samples can only provide a snapshot of a specific moment in time. But while pictures represent visually, dust contain material evidence that opens more deciphering opportunities. The science behind the dust is well known. Archaeology, microbiology, allegory, forensic and environmental science. As we peer through the lens, dust reveals itself as a detailed story. At this point, I got excited not only by the material itself, but also by the combination of the two concepts of dust and house. Dust is a concept rich in cultural and social myth throughout human history. Cloth in hand, we erase proofs of our mortality, wrote the philosopher Michael Marder. The dust breathing, photographed by Man Ray, resonance the dust superpower to conceal and reveal simultaneously. The concept of home is long time embedded in human behavior. It can be seen as the foundation upon which every other aspect of human life is built. Home is embedded into the physicality of the house. Dust from one house tells the story of people. Dust from several houses tells the story of a city. Dust from several cities tells the story of a country and continents. So what are we going to do with all this valuable information thrown under our feet? The Dust Project collects a million dust samples from homes worldwide in a short period of time through a global multilingual edutainment campaign. It yields three distinct archives that offer a comprehensive view of human activity and the environment over time and a one-of-a-kind public experience of shared testimony. An advanced digital platform enables you to register free of charge based on geolocation. You will receive a state-of-the-art envelope-sized dust collection kit delivered to your doorstep. In the week between receiving the kit and taking the sample, you might want to bake your favorite cookies, wear a shirt with sentimental value, or invite your parents over. Then, with a collection sticker, Swipe around areas of the house to get a meaningful sample. Your sample will be divided to three parts to establish the dust archives. The mission of the archives is to create a framework that enables the active participation of the public in research and education projects. The first archive consists of samples kept by the participants at their home. It will serve as a personal connection between them and the project for current and future research, as well as a unique family heirloom. The second archive is hosted in a museum. It will serve as a more centralized and, and accessible data source and will offer multiple ways to engage with the project findings by the general public. 
the third archives, is stored inside the dust arc, a round passive satellite in the shape of the Earth, placed in orbit 2,000 kilometer altitude from Earth as a future archaeological artifact. With a 1.4 meter in diameter and a highly reflective exterior, dust arc can be seen from Earth with regular telescopes and it will stay in its orbit for at least a century. Maybe one day, the Ark will reach futuristic deciphering technologies that will recreate moments, including tastes, smells, and textures. If humanity or the Earth will dramatically change, we may be leaving behind not only names and pictures, but also a tangible experience from our life story. Thank you. Thank you, Yael. Our next speaker was a designer in his previous life, but now works with students on AI. So as you can imagine, it's a fun time and changing all the time. He's here to share some of his experiments. Please welcome out Dave Elving. So chat GPT is a superpower for teaching and learning. We're probably sick of headlines like this, but I believe this is so. And I believe it's especially true for teaching and learning with code. And so what I'd like to share with you today is my experience of teaching with chat GPT in my interaction design class at the California College of Art. But before I talk about new ways of teaching and learning with code, we need to take a look at the way it's been taught historically. So this is something that might look familiar to you. It's a Hello World script that writes two words onto a screen, and it looks complicated and impenetrable, and this is the way most of us are exposed to coding. And when I first started learning how to code, I had a professor who wrote variables and functions on the board with a blackboard. I struggled my way to a D on the midterm, and I dropped out. So what would a new Hello World experience in the world of AI look like? Well, it might be a little bit like this. This is a music visualization that I developed using P5.js, and it connected to the accelerometer in an iPhone so that as you moved the phone around, the shape would change, and you could switch between tracks. As you might expect, this was a little complicated coding-wise, and I plopped my students right into these hundreds of lines of code, and they were intimidated. But I told them, I don't expect you to learn every little piece of code and every little variable. Instead, we're gonna to work together with ChatGPT to make this project your own. And to do that, we're going to use natural language. That's what ChatGPT really affords us. So I'll show you some of the things that my students did once I gave them that project. ChatGPT doesn't make the best slides, but one of the first things students wanted to do was, instead of a still image in the background, could I have a moving video? And this allowed me to explain where the background was rendered, what an array is, and how it works. I had another student who didn't just want one visualization in the center of the screen, he wanted two of them coming together and, and apart like cell mitosis. It was complicated. It'll make more sense if I show you some examples of their work. So the first example I want to show you is from Clarice. So you can see she has videos playing in the background as she moves the phone, the track and the image changes, and she changed the particles from circles to triangles, which allowed me to teach about classes and objects. My next student, Abed, he ditched the whole notion of a circle and instead had these waveforms growing together and apart. You'll see him as he moves his phone, he switches the track. He made the experience unique and his own. And we worked a lot with ChatGPT to refine it. The last example I'll show you is from Weechen. He wanted to have two visualizations and of course swap out the music and the image and was able to make that work. And as you see him moving his phone, you'll see the image and the, the waveforms kind of change. He's actually demonstrating right now the volume goes down as you lower the phone, the volume comes up. They really liked this. I got good feedback. My favorite feedback was, the coding parts are a bit too hard, or some of the class material is too difficult, because working with AI and machine learning doesn't make things easier. Teaching and learning is still hard. So five, what does this mean? So what? Five takeaways to inform teaching and learning that I gathered from this class. The first concept I want to share, the first idea, 
is that concepts and problem solving are what really matter. Mastery doesn't. Nobody has to go through memorizing syntax and doing that hello world example anymore. Instead, we can use computational thinking and natu natural language to create with code. And this leads to the second takeaway I want to share, that exploration matters more than direction. I could plot my students in something really complex, and they could, with ChatGPT and my help, chart their own path, not build piece by piece in a directed way. But ChatGPT isn't perfect. Machine learning systems generate examples, not answers. They still needed my help to integrate the code that ChatGPT was giving them. And I had to walk around and work with them individually to make it work. It doesn't work out of the box. Which gets to the fourth point. This technology actually means that more is required of teachers and students, not less. We've been empowered, but with that empowerment comes expectations. We can do more, we have to teach more, we have to know more. It's just different. And lastly, artificial intelligence is here. We have a responsibility to teach and learn with it. ChatGPT is in the news now, but many of you probably are already aware of new models that are coming out that are even more accessible and easy to run. This is my class. We were small, but made it a little bit easier to work with this technology. But I think these ideas scale and will have long-term impact on how we teach and learn going forward. So thank you very much and uh, appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Our next speaker is exploring a new type of clock, one that's been around for a millennia or more, uh, a tidal clock. Please welcome, or please enjoy, Sarah Sunday's video. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. So 36.5, a durational performance with the C, is a series of nine site-specific performances and video artworks made in collaboration with communities around the world, where I have stood in bodies of water for a full idle cycle between 12 and 13 hours each time. And it all began as a poetic response to Hurricane Sandy hitting New York City in October of 2012. Because what happened was I suddenly understood just how vulnerable we were. We know that civilizations come and go intellectually, but could my beloved city disappear in my lifetime? What was water trying to tell us about the future? These were the questions I was asking. And I kept imagining this little artist or any person really running around the city trying to make ends meet and the city's just sinking beneath her feet. And I kept on thinking about this parallel between the struggle for an individual to survive on a daily basis and the struggle for humanity to survive in the face of the climate crisis. And then nine months later, I'm up in Maine, and I realized that the tides could function as a metaphor for sea level rise. So one day, I walk out at low tide and I let the water rise up to my chin and then I let it go back down again over the course of 12 hours and 48. And I didn't know if I would make it through this whole cycle, but there was an important moment when the water was high and I understood in my body just how connected we all are. And I thought, if I'm this little person in New York City thinking about these things, what is someone in Bangladesh or Kenya thinking about? And I promised myself that if I made it through the cycle, I would create this in collaboration with communities around the world. And so that's what happened. Nine years, nine bodies of water, hundreds of collaborators, thousands of participants, a global project with a local approach. And here's what I learned. I learned about deep listening to the water, the more than human world, to the people and all other living beings who live near the water. And from my indigenous collaborators around the world, I learned about decentering the human. We're just one species after all, and reframing water as our kin and relation rather than as a resource. And they really taught me about engaging in daily practice of gratitude, reciprocity, asking permissions in relation to the water, the land, and ancestors. And I learned about deep time and long-term thinking my work has always been based around ideas of time, questions about expanding and contracting time, 
But with 36.5, I started to really look at the ancient past in order to try to understand the long-term, but perhaps not so distant future we have with rising seas. And then on an individual scale, I learned about feeling time as a sensory experience. Because it's one thing to consider climate change intellectually, and it's a completely different thing to feel the water rise on your body over the course of a day, or to witness this happening. Because we know everything is temporary, and we're only here on this planet for a short amount of time. And I try to recognize the beauty and the terror of this fact. What can I do in my short little blip of a life? And for me, it's about tracking time, literally and symbolically on my body, and then connecting with as many people as possible, inviting them to experience this with me. In this act, I find some hope. So now that the performances for 36.5 are complete, there are several outgrowth exhibitions and a book things happening, but I'm following one new thread to explore ideas about living in ecological time more of the time. So I'm curious to see if I can possibly let go of the mechanical clock and find a tidal clock in my body. I'm trying to train myself to sense the water levels at all times and tune my body to live in tidal time even when I'm not at the water's edge. What can happen if we synchronize the salty water in our bodies to the salt water that's hovering seven tenths of the planet? Could this help us be better prepared and adapt to a future with more water? What if we just need to tune in? Thank you so much. You know, so often for me, uh, meditations like this on the earth, like what Sarah did and what Altai gave us, just really kind of brings together what the long now is about, about appreciating this earth that we're on. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, our next speaker is quite the communicator. That's what she does professionally, and it's also her passion. So today she's going to be talking about oral history, which is something... I'm sure we've all had to study throughout our days. Please welcome out Diane Tate. The people of the book. You may have heard this expression before regarding the Jewish people. It's because many Jewish people have a deep love and reverence for the Hebrew scriptures, the book of Torah. But actually, it's somewhat of a misnomer when it comes to the Jewish people because the Jewish faith for millennium, for generations, was passed down from one generation to the other verbally. It's an oral tradition. In fact, the Jewish faith is one of many, many oral traditions that impact our culture and many other cultures. Tonight, we're gonna look at one type of oral tradition, oral history. So first of all, what is oral history? Well, it's a way to get at historical events through the lens of individual experiences, through interviews. It's a way to capture what happened with people's memories and perceptions of what transgressed in the past. But why do we care? Well, often the official historical narrative leaves out critical voices and perspectives. Many times, marginalized, disenfranchised, disenfranchised voices are left out of the narrative. And so it gives us an incomplete picture of history. 10 years ago, no, actually 13 years ago, almost to the day, Frank Gavin, an historian, came to the Long Now and shared his vision, his perspective of history, which is that horizontal history, many factors come into play to affect the historical narrative. Well, I would posit that oral history is the human lens. It's the overlay among all these variables to give meaning and explanation to what happens in the history. It's sort of like an accounting statement with footnotes. They make it make sense. Steven Spielberg totally understood the power of oral history when he was making Schindler's List. He realized that there were so many human stories that needed to be told, not only to complete the picture of the Holocaust, but to help us connect with it as humans. And he knew that was important, so he partnered with USC to start the Shoah Foundation. They collect thousands of Holocaust survivor stories so that not only do we know more about the Holocaust, 
but we understand on a human level what it meant and we learn from it. Isabel Wilkerson uses oral history significantly in her study of the Great Migration. She interviewed over 1,200 people and did a deep dive interviewing intensely three of these people. Between 1915 and 1970, over six million African Americans left the South to other parts of the US to get better economic opportunity, but especially to escape the racial regime of Jim Crow. So some of the folks that she focused on included Ida Mae Brandon Gladney. She was living in Mississippi with her husband when her husband's cousin was nearly killed for stealing some turkeys. So pregnant with two small children, her and her husband left for Chicago to find opportunity. Instead, they found a glutted labor market and they were competing not only with other migrants, but with immigrants. They became the bottom of the pecking order again. It was not pretty. George Foster Starling is another person that Isabel Wilkerson spoke with. He was born in Florida and college educated and soon learned and understood that they were being exploited in the fields, and so he organized his co-laborers to demand more money. He was nearly killed, so he went to New York City. There, he didn't see white signs or colored signs, and he could go to a bar and get served, but the bartender would make it very clear that he wasn't welcome by smashing the glass loudly upon his departure. And finally, Dr. Robert Joseph Pershing Foster was an accomplished physician and surgeon in World War II, but when he returned to Monroe, Louisiana, he learned that he couldn't even do a simple tonsillectomy. So he went to Los Angeles so he could practice medicine. But sadly, even the journey there began to reveal the kind of obstruction and resistance he would face. Driving up to a hotel and a vacancy sign becomes a no vacancy sign the subtle rejection and exclusion continued. All these stories tell us that the Great Migration, while leading to economic opportunity, also didn't close the limitations and the oppression that many black people faced. And because these are human stories, we can relate to them on a personal level and reflect. So I would ask you, who in your backyard has lived through an historical event, small or large? What are their perceptions, their memories? What did they experience? And what can they add to the historical narrative? Get curious and do some research. And then turn on your phone and ask them some questions and capture it. And if they agree, share it with others so that others not only have a fuller picture of history, but they connect with it as humans. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Our next speaker has been in robotics for several decades and is gonna share her deep thinking on the ethics of AI and robotics. Please welcome out Andra Kiei. Good day, everybody. Haven't these talks been amazing? Let's hear it for everyone, yeah? I do not want to follow them, but I'm just going to state the blindingly obvious. The world is burning. It's hotter than it has ever been in recorded history, our recorded history. What's more, the last time the world was this hot, people didn't exist. That's not a good omen. <laughs> the biggest problem is we know what the solution is. We just need to stop. Stop emitting 30 gigatons of greenhouse gases. Stop polluting. Stop rolling out polluting technologies. Just stop. Well, let's ask the Luddites how well that worked out for them. Okay? Stopping, not a strong point. Let's be radical and embrace technology. I'm team robot all the way. With robots, with drones in particular, and thermal imaging, we can detect heat leakage, particularly from old buildings, which are responsible for 99% of the heat waste. And we can't retrofit them. That's why the Department of Energy ran the e-robot prize to find robots that could go into attics and wall cavities and under the floor and replace all of that insulation. It's why 3D printing is a really great answer. We're eliminating transportation costs and waste. 
we're reducing waste. This is Texas. Uh, Icon is building 100 3D printed homes there. California, mighty buildings. But NASA had the centennial challenge about six years ago to use local materials, mud for Mars or for our homes here. But moving on to transport, eh? Self-driving cars, tip of the iceberg. Just a tiny little part of what we can achieve with autonomous mobile robot technologies. It's all about self-driving cargo, and these are all electric vehicles, right? Already the major retailers know this. This is JD.com, same thing at Ocado, or Amazon, or Walmart. But what's been exciting over the last five years is the plethora of new autonomous mobile robots roaming out into the world. You probably don't see them. But we're rethinking how we move materials, changing the first mile, changing the last mile, and all the miles in between. And before you say, well, hey, electricity isn't all it's cracked up to be, right? We are introducing solar power faster than ever before because we're using robots to help construct solar farms and to keep them clean. We have new battery technologies coming. This one I love, it is carbon-based, plant-based. It is already in commercial deployment, multiple units last year, and 2025, the first fully eco-sustainable battery. Alpha Garden, you probably know Ken Goldberg. It's a project of his up at UC Berkeley to show that robotics and AI can perform organic multi-crop tending as well as people can. Farmers are embracing robotic technology, and this is not the massive machines of our previous agricultural systems. These are smaller, lighter machines from the actual tractors in use today to new devices like this uh, lovely little dandelion robot from France. And that allows us to get into 20% of the arable area that is currently not utilized and to stop the soil compaction that is destroying our ability to use the land. We can now do proper regenerative practices in agriculture with the use of robots, including solar powered wind sail robots like Agen just up the coast here. Let us not forget animal happy cows. Cows have been looked after 24 seven by robots. And you know what? Their hormone levels show that they are happy. And so does the milk. So all I can say is forget that AI apocalypse. There is nothing that the smartest artificial intelligence can do that stupid humans haven't already buggered up. <laughs> Embrace the robots. Let us save the planet with robots, okay? Viva Robotopia! Woo! You know, I feel like with Andrew, you'd, you'd, you'd be rooting for Arnie in the first Terminator. Um, our next speaker is a storyteller by day, architect by night, and does some fun urban planning experiments in his home on Cyprus. Please enjoy his video. So nine years ago, I quit my job as a cryonics. You know, for those people who want to freeze themselves for a thousand years, hoping to wake up in a better world. My job was to make sure their frozen bodies would stay safe and sound for all that long. No pressure, right? I mean, how do you even design the ability to last for a millennium? Well, or if there's a zombie apocalypse or a giant meteor or another global pandemic, how do you guarantee your clients will end up as popsicles for some alien invaders or in a zoo? I mean, given that nothing lasts forever, what is a literally sustainable design? Well, good luck finding any answers on the internet. Most of what you'll find are a bunch of greenwashing products and programs that claim to be eco-friendly, but they're actually just as bad, if not worse, than the status quo. I mean, they promise to have a net zero impact, but they don't tell you how they measure that or what they do with the waste, or how they exploit the workers, or how they bribe the politicians. I mean, they don't care about your future. They primarily care about their profit. What made me just about give up, though, was when I was working on a huge map for San Antonio, a map that showed all the infrastructure, you know, planned and the existing, a map that revealed a shocking truth 
25% of the pipes underground, they're old and rot. They're leaking, cracking, bursting, contaminating the water supply. They were violating the Clean Water Act and the city was facing like a billion dollar fine to fix them. How do you explain that to the voters? How do you tell them they have to fork over billions of dollars for something they never ask, never see, never care about? How do you tell them they have to pay for flushing toilets? You know, so that's the burning question. How do we create a truly sustainable human? You know, a world where we don't ruin everything for ourselves and our kids. A world where we don't have to worry about climate change, pollution, resource depletion, extinction. A world where we can have a harmonious story between us and nature. After a year, I was so stressed out by this question that I decided to seek some spiritual guidance. I ended up cooking breakfast for this Tibetan monk. He was very nice, very wise, very bald. But over some scrambled eggs and coffee, he asked me what was bothering me. What did I want to learn? I babbled on about my interest in impermanence, fractal geometry, psychology, storytelling. And he stopped and he said, storytelling, that's it. That research needs to be done. So I did. I, I quit my job and I'm back with cats and I moved to Cyprus. Here I read a lot of books and articles and I came across this amazing story about two Australian researchers who were following a songla. Now a songla, turns out, it's like an epic GPS the Aboriginal people have used to navigate the land. They sing the stories, and if they're going in the right direction, the land forms along the way correspond to the characters in the story. Okay, so the year is 2014, and these researchers are walking along, singing their little hearts out, when suddenly they're standing in the sea. They thought, maybe they messed up somehow. Maybe they took a wrong turn at the burning bush. But then they realized, maybe the song continues under the water. And sure enough, they found the rest of the landmarks submerged in the sea on oceanic charts. This song line was so old, it dated back to the last ice age when the sea level was at. This song line had survived for like 10,500 years, passed down by word of mouth for at least 500 generations. Now, that's longer than any cryonics project I've dreamed of. Probably more fun. Well, this blew my mind. How can we use this ancient technology to shape our future? Maybe we could leverage continuity going backwards to go forwards, but how can we tell our stories to the land like that and make them stick? Well, it turns out it's just that simple. You need to map your stories. You know, the stories you tell yourself or your friends or your therapist. No meaningful stories. The, the stories that make up who you are and where you come from. All those stories have a setting. And a setting can be mapped. Imagine our stories like, like a tapestry. And when we laid them out on the land, we could see how the threads of each other's stories intertwine, how they tug at each other, how they harmonize. And with this knowledge, we can spin new tales that build upon the old, you know, like weaving new threads to fill in the worn holes of our tents. And math of our stories isn't just for personal insight. We could use them to guide decisions about our neighborhoods, climate, immigration, business, development, isolation. We can make sure that everything we do is in harmony with our stories, or at least not contradicted. Now, just to live together, we need to know where each other are coming from. The Aboriginal people of Australia showed me that the stories mixed with the land can last for thousands of years. So, so using stories of the people here in Famagusta, I made a prototype of a uh, map of stories you know, that you know, we and our descendants could adapt and evolve in the changing world. Stories that could last for 10,000 years or more. Now, we all know there are gaps in the structures that support our society. In order to enable communities to plug those gaps, we need to build a narrative infrastructure map, one that maps stories and communities across the world. With narrative tools and GIS, we can create a narrative infrastructure for the future. A future that's not on ice, but alive with stories. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Our next speaker, we've got three talks left. Uh, our next speaker loved camping so much that she's dedicated her career to it. She started the website Hip Camp. Can I get a cheer? Yeah. And her website has unlocked millions of acres of private lands for camping. And if I was to sum up her talk, it's if you want a green planet, you should camp. So please welcome out Alyssa Ravasio. Hello, good evening. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Alyssa Ravasio. I love camping. I love camping so much, I created a company to uh, get more people outside, and we've opened access to about 5 million acres of land on this very beautiful planet we call Earth. Um, 
it's a really awesome planet. Um, it has this really unique ability to sustain life, which is really important uh, to all of us here um, and to all of the beings on Earth. And something that I think about all the time is that our planet's ability to sustain that life is dropping rapidly. And this is happening on our watch during our lifetimes. Um, and it's a real tragedy. Um, this is mostly cause, the leading cause is habitat loss and habitat destruction, um, which really happen as a direct result of actions we take um, consciously. And I think it's just a really, um, yeah, tragic uh, showcase of our cultural values. However, um, there is a bold, beautiful vision known as Half Earth, which I'm sure we're mostly familiar with here. The late wrote E.O. Wilson uh, theorized that if we can set aside at least one half of the Earth, um, we can sustain life on Earth um, for a long time into the future. Now, the main way we do this is through purchasing land and purchasing conservation easements on that land, which is really effective at stopping development but has a major problem, which is that there's no ongoing system or funding to support the maintenance and stewardship of that land. This is a big problem. Even with that acknowledgement, the world is moving forward here, which is exciting. Uh, last year at COP15, 190 countries signed an agreement to go for 30 by 2030. Uh, the US did not sign, um, but by executive order is participating. This is Deputy Secretary of Biodiversity, Jen Norris, that's a real title. Um, and she's leading California, which is leading the world on this. We're on track for 25% um, already and 30% by 2030. I was invited to participate at Half Earth Day recently. And um, really the purpose of that discussion was to say like, how are we going to solve this major challenge of supporting half the earth um, long into the future? Because half of the earth is a lot of land <laughs> and the future is a really long time. And the perspective I bring to this conversation is that if you look at the land today, the reality is that most of it is privately held. And especially when we look at what's public today and getting to half earth, um, private land and the future of those lands is really where the fate of our biosphere hangs today. And what's interesting is that this land is owned by people and people react to incentives. And um, the future of conservation, Aldo Leopold said it well, is really going to come down to how do we reward the people who currently have these lands. And this is where outdoor recreation comes in, generally, and camping specifically. Um, outdoor recreation creates a really powerful economic engine that rewards people who are keeping their lands open and free and natural, fun places to play. Um, I had this experience personally. I went to meet a rancher um, a few years back who'd started hosting campers and the first thing she did was hand me this letter and she said, you know, I hate this letter. They want to buy my land and build a big hotel, but I'm terrified. I'm going to have to call them, except now that I've got camping, this is junk mail. I don't need it. I know I can take care of my land. These people want to do the right thing. I'm yet to meet anybody who takes care of the land who doesn't want to leave it better than they found it, but they need to have the economic support to do that. Not only do people use this income from outdoor recreation to keep their land, they actually proactively invest it. The majority of people who are earning income from camping proactively invest in stewardship. Think native species, rewilding, restoring stream beds. Outdoor recreation also plays a big role in the solution here by changing culture. Um, another great E.O. Wilson concept, biophilia. We have an innate love for nature. We get outside, we can't help but fall in love with it and we protect what we love. Chris Tompkins said that really well. She also holds the distinct privilege of being the human who's protected the most land on earth at 15 million acres, which is a lot. Um, and so we have to get more people outside to fall in love with nature and develop that passion for protecting it. So in summary, outdoor recreation can play a huge role in solving this challenge that stands between us and half earth by developing sustainable, scalable systems that can support the land economically and create a culture that continues to encourage that. So I encourage you all to get outside and next time you're sitting out enjoying the beauty of our earth under the stars, um, please know that you are contributing to a beautiful future for our planet in a really positive way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alyssa.
Our next speaker is a best-selling author of the book, A Sense of the World. It's about a blind man who traveled the world, fought the slave trade, went to Africa, froze in the Arctic. But today he's here for a slightly more tongue-in-cheek topic. Please welcome Jason Roberts. These words are the title of my presentation, followed by my name. Um, now, now, now you'll, you'll know what it doesn't say by Jason Roberts, because in early 21st century San Francisco, you don't need to do that. It's implied. Now, I just spent 15 seconds telling you the obvious, and here's why. I am a writer. I'm a writer of books, mostly nonfiction books, mostly historical nonfiction books, which means I'm also an historian kind of deal with the past. Now, there are a lot of challenges in terms of dealing with the past. Um, there are texts that are lost, there are texts that are biased, uh, translations that are wrong, some things that can't be translated, like this is the Voynich manuscript. And there's lots of lost content. But the worst thing is that encapsulated in the phrase, it goes without saying. So much history actually is lost to us, not because the historical record is gone, but because it was never in the historical record in the first place. Why waste useful papyruses or anything like that to say what's completely obvious, what's common knowledge? These are Roman dodecahedrons. These are these 12-sided metal and stone objects that we find in hundreds of ancient Roman sites throughout Europe. What are they? We don't know. We have plenty of theories. They might be fishing weights. They might be musical instruments. They might be uh, early Dungeons and Dragons. But the, the point is that we have to guess because the Romans, they were so commonplace that the instructions on how to use them were commonplace. Here's garum. Now, the Romans loved garum. It's this condiment. They used it on everything. It was their mayonnaise and mustard and salt and pepper all put together. Their entire economy was built around it. But we don't know what it was, except for the fact that it seems to have involved fish. <laughs> now, we have plenty of Roman recipes. In fact, the word recipe is Latin for first you take, like first you take a fish. But of the hundreds, if not thousands of recipes, none of them is for the most common object. Here's another thing. Um, there, in the Bible itself, there's this character called the disciple whom Jesus loved, which you think would be kind of a, a big deal. And Jesus thought he was a big deal. He sat next to him in the Last Supper. In fact, at some point, Jesus puts his head in his lap. It's a very important person. He was adopted by the Virgin Mary. He's the one who discovers the resurrection. He's granted immortality, and he's one of the authors of the Bible. But for the other authors of the Bible, they thought nobody needed to say who he was. His identity went without saying. Now, here's a big question. Why are they called buggies? When you think about it, that's kind of a strange name for a horse and carriage. So I thought it might be a very interesting answer. So I posed it to the champion of interesting answers, ChatGPT. <laughs> now, it, it, says, it says here um, that um, it originally referred to a frightening specter of hobgoblin, blah, 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 refers to a small lightweight vehicle associated with blah, blah, blah. The point is that that was all wrong. I asked the question because I knew that there is no answer to it. And when I went, and then it actually started hallucinating the answer. Now, for that reason, I believe I need to propose something called DOI, the Depository of Obvious Information. For future generations, let's create, let's say the unsaid. That idea that it goes without saying is not necessary because honestly, uncommon knowledge it becomes common knowledge and vice versa. Most importantly, here's a question. What is the FAA definition of flight? See, some things aren't quite trivial. It turns out there is no definition for flight. There's a definition for flight time, which begins when, when a vehicle pushes forward for the purpose of flight, but there is no actual definition of flight, which is interesting because it turns out that, you know, qualified pilots need certain degrees of flight time. Your pilot could have 100 degrees of flight time, but actually no five minutes of actual flight. Or here's another example, a sudden death. Uh, I looked on Wikipedia, I looked everywhere on the internet, there's no definition that describes that no actual death is involved. <laughs> and in fact, I asked this question, what does the phrase, my ultimate team encountered sudden death mean? Something went wrong. Ah. 
If it's going to confuse AI, it's going to confuse future generations. So, you know, uh, this is the thing. Confusion is actually useful. Instead of trying to gloss over these things, instead of having AI you know, hallucinate the answers, how about it identifies where those gaps in knowledge are? It could work with us to identify those gaps and basically create the depository of obvious information. So join me, won't you? Join me in saying, maybe you don't know what I mean. Maybe you want to. Maybe we can bridge that gap. Thank you very much. All right, we're on our penultimate talk. And uh, Natalia Vasquez is basically leads IDEO's global uh, climate foresight work. And today she's going to take us on a tour of 2030. Please welcome, or please enjoy Natalia Vasquez's video. For the last six months, I've been visioning climate futures with about 50 designers at Innovation Consultancy IDEO because I believe futuring will be a powerful tool in our collective climate action. So come with me to 2034, let's check it out. Last night I went down and I watched the offshore wind turbines in the bay, you know, the ones they made into sculptures so folks would let them be built by the hundreds. And looking up, I could see all the satellites between the stars analyzing for methane leaks and biomatter loss, really beautiful. I freelance in auditing greenhouse gases, so I'll get a ping to check out a site where there might be a leak or where reforestation might be working, and then I'll take a bunch of photos, and they use it for emissions accounting and training the spatial image analysis. My last gig was verifying the algae bloom happening off the coast of Chile, and since the government had offered a cleanup bounty to protect their biodiversity credit, there was a rush of folks there to harvest and sell to the bioplastics market. And with the algae bloom feeding the global bioplastics market, there's been so much more algae-based product in shops right now. I just got my IKEA mycelium stool and lamp, too. And I've been redecorating my apartment in the regenerative style, which has been a lot easier because of the tax credits that we all have. But you know, that means consumption, and we're all trying to reduce while we land this transition from fossil fuel production within our individual carbon rations. And I still sometimes buy stuff. You know, it's hard to change. But... Things have also gotten more expensive with the global tax from the Re Ministry of Regeneration that goes to pay out reparations to climate-impacted countries. I've been trying to stay away from stuff with a carbon rating of less than three, but often that's the good stuff, and I did get some fines this week. So I joined one of these consumer anonymous groups. It's been helpful to just kind of talk to people. We're also struggling in the shift to consume less and to shift from single-use to reusable. Fortunately, that's been a little bit easier lately, um, and that's largely because of the universal reusable packaging system that we're all now required to use. Um, and I love how I can pick up takeout now in an airport in Tokyo and return that container in any store in the world, including here in San Francisco. My home is getting a little full of these standardized packages, but um, I actually love that the, when the universal reusable packaging mandate filled custom container shapes and labeling, um, that now all the brand is sort of expressed digitally. Um, and it feels like I'm actually learning a lot more and I just have less stuff to deal with in my house. And since they halted the fashion production and we're all using, uh, we're supposed to be reusing clothes for the next hundred years, I rent new outfits with my Rent Anywhere card from any store, anywhere in the world. And it's fun to see all the people who have owned it in the last 10 years. Well, anyway, last night after I watched the wind turbines, I picked up my car, which I'd left charging with these supercharged streetlights. And I made a few bucks on the way home, swapping out my battery at one of the, um, swap station um, between here and Marin. Honestly, this whole decarbonized grid movement has been great. My apartment is tiny, and like most people now, I've got one table for cooking, charging, heating the space. In the gas era, this would have taken so much more space, but now that we've electrified everything, my life is full of simpler things. And like everyone else, my neighborhood is part of a distributed energy community, plugged into the city grid, but producing energy all day, guided by software to help us optimize production with the weather. And more and more, life has been like that, individuals functioning as an ecosystem. So back to 2023, the world you just visited is part of an effort we've been doing to create speculative conditions for the future with industrial designers, emerging technologists, anthropologists, and certainly we are mostly wrong about the future, but that's not the point. 
designing our way out of the climate crisis must consider future scenarios. And friends, we are short on vision. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has a 40-page PDF of text, and really text is most of what you get if you search for climate futures. How can we be expected to derive without the destination in mind? Numbers just don't shift hard. We also need to be able to collectively picture shifts down to the minutia, down to the mundane, and we need to be able to get excited about that picture in our mind. This is one of the most widely circulated, non-dystopic visualized climate features, and it's from a yogurt company, Chopani. The fictive community has brought us some wonderful books and recently a TV series, but we need more. We need more to picture and think about together. So we've been sketching the human angle of futures, behaviors, products, rituals, and our goal has been to create stimuli visually rich enough to get wheels turning, to light a fire under the organizations that we work with, and ultimately to start hard conversation. And we need more, one for each life, for your life. What does your life look like in a climate impacted 2030? No, really, what just flashed in your brain? Let's get more of those visions born and out into the world. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, so this is our last talk, and you are all welcome to stay and hang out. We have a beverage minimum. You can help us out with that. Uh, you can also reconnect. It's been a while since we had one of these. Uh, but now we're going to welcome out our final speaker. She's a designer, and she's going to talk about what happens when the medical system intercepts or uh, intersects with our humanity. Please welcome out Natasha Bloom. Famous last words are notorious for not being able to predict the future well. <laughs> but they do convey our inner world magnificently. My name is Natasha, and I lead an innovation consultancy called Blumline, where we study people and culture to design smarter, kinder, wiser futures. My shelter in place did not include any sourdough or much sleep, <laughs> but it did include working with the healthcare innovation community to try to prop up the system uh, with COVID-19 response through the design thinking lens. We rapidly created a brand and recruited volunteers for PPE challenges, masks, blood donation, but the real challenge was the rising death toll and the end of life, which was really at the center of the entire pandemic. Frontline caregivers were required to make decisions for people they had barely met and required to resuscitate, even when it would cause irreparable harm, which most people didn't know coming in without advanced directives. The team and I worked on uncovering insights, and we realized that a journey map was really the best way to tell this story, to illustrate to people the pathway of what happens when you get COVID, and you go into the hospital, become intubated, and are likely unconscious, it's not the best way to advocate for yourself or your agency. And a lot of this wasn't tremendously uh, unfamiliar, working with chronic conditions and behavior change. But we had a unique moment in time. The pandemic actually created an opening. We call it a moment of truth, where possibility um, can become a reality, but people still need solutions. So we created one called Famous Last Words that was set in three parts, life, death, and dying. And it was a collective self-discovery ritual, which means looking at self and values first, but in the company of other people where we can actually learn relational dynamics. About burial, mycelium suit, the ash cannon by Hunter S. Thompson, and Tibetan sky rituals, all examples of more creative ways of thinking about the end of life, which is something that we don't usually do. We usually avoid it uh, and treat it as something to fight against. For me, this was motivated by my grandmother, uh, whose end of life wishes I know very well. She has multiple DNRs plastered all over her house. <laughs> but her emotional side is a little harder, I think, she has a hard time understanding that she might have a right to think more creatively about aging. 
Care comes in many forms, like the warm water glove in the Brazilian ICU that comforted a COVID patient, or the butterfly kisses for a cancer patient that were attracted by orange juice. Exploring different cultures and different settings is essential. You know, we can participate in revelry, or we can talk about death through the medical system through paperwork, which sounds super fun. <laughs> or we can bring beauty and rouse courage through that. And the, bring the mystical back into our experience. It isn't by avoiding death that we get more comfortable with it. It's by confronting it, uh, but in a generous way, not in a death porn sense. And one of the best questions I find for this is asking, who is the you of now? Because certainly none of us are who we were three years ago. And thank goodness, I'm not. Sometimes you walk through a portal you don't even see coming. And that's the beauty of thinking about futures. We just don't know. It makes it difficult to think about death because we write things like final wishes. But nothing's final. We have to come back to it again and again. We have to slow down. And we have to be willing to revisit it. And to go into spaces that can teach us more than we think they can. So I encourage you to explore collective self-discovery with me. And let me know how you're getting creative. Yeah, last time I made the mistake of putting her in the middle, and that just didn't work. All right, we are done. You are welcome to stay. Uh, I want to thank Club Fugazi for having us. Thanks to the long... <laughs> thank you very much to the long now. It's such a joy to do this with you. And thank you to our wonderful speakers for putting up with all these directions. <laughs> <laughs>